Welcome to this lesson. Uh, hopefully you're watching this on Monday, the 30th of March, and this is the first lesson for the new um, module 6.3 uh, unit, Manipulating Genomes from OCR um, Biology A-Level. So I wanted to start by showing you this slide here. So this slide it represents the DNA code uh, of a gene, a gene that codes for something called P53. And you can see there, there's a whole lot of letters uh, and under, underneath every triplet, uh, it tells you the amino acid that these um, DNA bases code for. So if you want to sequence a gene like this, how do you get this information? And that's what we're going to be looking at today. What methods do biochemists use to sequence DNA so they can have information like this, or even, for example, sequence uh, the entire genome of the coronavirus uh, only a few days after it was isolated uh, back in January? So first of all, I'd like you to look at this graph that's shown here. Uh, and I'd like you to pause the video and see if you can describe the trend in the graph. And, and maybe if you thought that this might be worth four marks, you could sort of identify different regions of the graph uh, and comment to try and get four marks. So hopefully uh, you had a look at that. You can see that um, the original cost of sequencing a whole uh, genome, a sort of human sized genome, was actually 100 million US dollars back in 2002. Uh, it fell relatively steadily um, to about 10 million US dollars in about 2007. And then there was a rapid decline as newer generation sequencing uh, methods came online uh, and it's still falling. You may have also noticed that this axis over here is logarithmic. So every single large square here represents a tenfold reduction in the sequencing cost. Uh, and now you can get personal DNA sequencing pretty simply uh, from companies such as 23andMe and other companies. Uh, and, you know, it costs uh, about £150. It's not a full sequence, but it, it's the, the, quite a lot of the information. So in terms of what we're doing today, um, these are the syllabus points from the specification. Uh, and it's this one here that we're really focusing on. The principles of DNA sequencing and the development of new sequence techniques. So we're going to be looking at um, about four different types of DNA sequencing. Uh, and you need to understand the kind of basic principles behind it. So you, need, you don't need to know the full detail for all of the newer techniques, although you do need to know the basics of Sanger sequencing and also pyro sequencing. Um, but you might be taught, you might be given information about other methods of sequencing and kind of have to apply those principles. So let's look at the first one. So the first type of DNA sequencing was called Sanger sequencing. And this was uh, named after a guy called Fred Sanger, who worked in the 70s and, and developed this method. And his method um, basically relied on um, copying the DNA. And I'll take you now to a little uh, doddle presentation on that uh, so we can have a look at it. Okay, so here we're gonna go through uh, the Sanger method of DNA sequencing. So the Sanger method uses two different varieties of nucleotide. So the first nucleotide is the regular uh, deoxynucleotide that is normally found in DNA. So here we have a base that could be A, C, T, or G. Here we have a ribose sugar. And we see that the ribose sugar at its third carbon, so would be carbon one, two, and three. At carbon three, it has a OH group, a hydroxide. Now the other type of um, nucleotide that he used was something called a dideoxynucleotide. And this is missing that OH group. So these specially modified dideoxynucleotides are going to be important later on. And we'll see that um, the reason they're important is because if they're added to a growing DNA chain during polymerization, they will stop the growth of that chain because they lack this uh, hydroxyl group here and a new phosphodiester bond that can't be made there. So let's see how it works. So we put the dideoxynucleotide into a test tube. Into that, we add many copies of the DNA strand that we want to sequence. So these copies are made using a process called polymerase chain reaction uh, that amplifies the DNA copies. So um, then we add in also the regular bases. We add in adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine. Regular uh, normal um, DNA bases. 
So in go those uh, four regular bases. And as the animation says, those are the raw materials that are going to be needed um, to replicate the uh, DNA sequence, to replicate the DNA um, strand. So here's what happens. In the tube, the DNA polymerase binds to a primer, first of all. So this primer here is a little short segment of RNA that's needed for the DNA polymerase to bind. And when it binds, it takes these regular um, nucleotides and it joins them to the chain, joins them to the single-stranded molecule of DNA. Now, it might copy the whole chain, as we saw there, but it might not. It won't if it encounters a dideoxynucleotide. If it encounters a dideoxynucleotide, it will stop. So Sanger did this same method four times, and he added different dideoxynucleotides into each one. So this would be maybe like a dideoxyadenine base, dideoxycytosine, uh, dideoxyguanine, and dideoxythymine, for example. He put the four tubes into the, um, the kind of copying machine. It's called a thermocycle, which um, allows the DNA polymerase to work. And what you get then is different lengths of copied DNA. Some uh, lengths of copied DNA sort of run pretty much all the way to the end, but some are terminated shortly. So it's called a chain termination method. Uh, and that means that the chain started growing, copying, 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 but then one of these dideoxynucleotides um, was incorporated and that stops the process. So in each tube, there's a kind of mixture of some full, fully copied DNA chains and some shortly copied chains. So to separate these mixtures, he then put them into a uh, gel. OK, so, so we've got the four tubes. You take out a um, sample of each of those four tubes and you run them into a gel. Let's just have a look at that again. So pull out the samples. Put them in a gel. This is called gel electrophoresis. Now in gel electrophoresis, which we're going to look at later, the uh, DNA is separated according to the length and size of the DNA fragment. So shorter DNA chains, sorry, DNA strands that have been um, sort of terminated early by the addition of that dideoxynucleotide will move quite quickly through the gel. And longer strands, which kind of got all the way to the end of the DNA before they encountered randomly a dideoxynucleotide, would move much more slowly. So let's see how that happens. So the DNA moves along. We use a special loading die, which moves all the way to the end, so we know when to stop it, and we basically stop as it gets to the end. The gel that we would receive at the end would then have banding patterns like this. So what does that mean? That means that um, if we look here, these are the longest sort of um, molecules of DNA that have moved a short distance. So the um, this here, this band here, indicates that the sort of final base on our long chain of DNA is going to be a C, because that's stopped at a C. The next base in our long chain, sort of reading from the end backwards, is going to be a G, because this uh, band here represents all the copies of DNA that finished uh, sort of that length, but with a G. Then we read from the band like this, this would be a T, and so on. Let's see if you can complete that. See if you can write that sequence down. I'll give you a minute, just pause and then come back once you think you've got it. Okay, well, here it is. So the sequence that you read off from this, uh, this banding pattern is like that. Okay, pretty complicated, um, but hopefully you followed. Uh, and now let's just jump back to the PowerPoint to give you a little summary again. So. In summary, um, we have a single-stranded DNA fragment to be sequenced. Here it is. We add the little primer. That's this little bit here. And then we add a mixture. We had a mixture of normal nucleotides. Um, and then we separate it into four tubes, like this. And then into each of those four tubes, we add these special versions of the nucleotides, these dideoxynucleotides. And those special versions mean that if they get added to the growing chain, the chain will stop. So each time we get this special version at the end, the chain stops elongating. And then we take all of these and we separate those and put it into this gel. We can see that these three different lengths, these fragments, uh, produce these three bands here. These three 
uh, different lengths fragments produce these three bands here and so on and then we can read the sequence like this okay so now I'd like you to try and watch a video of that um, one more time if you want if you think you got it you can move on but I'll put this video link here in the description um, and now we'll come to a task seeing if you can kind of write an explanation of that so here's the copy complete activity see if you can copy this out uh, use the words in the corner here uh, the words in red to add into the gaps. Pause the video, take a few minutes, and then you can check your answers. Okay, time to review the answers. So I'll let you just green pen your work there for a second, see if you got it right. Uh, key, met, key points, single strand of DNA to start with, four tubes, dioxynucleotides, randomly terminating the chain, and then we separate by gel electrophoresis. Okay, so that's classic Sanger sequencing. And now I'd like you to watch this video uh, about automated dideoxy sequencing. It's kind of a um, slightly uh, more refined method of Sanger, uh, which you do need to know about. And you need to be able to interpret um, the banding pattern we just saw, and you also need to be able to interpret this type of thing, which is called a chromatograph. So watch the video, I'll put the link underneath in the description and then come back once you've done so. So the key points that I hope you got from that video were the following. So it still uses a chain termination method with a dideoxynucleotide. But in this instance, each different dideoxynucleotide is labeled with a different color sort of fluorescent molecule uh, uh, on the base. So you can see that sort of represented down here. The G's, the A's, the T's and the C's are different colors. They're fluorescent. So instead of using um, four different sort of parallel gels, you load them into a, a gel, which is down a very narrow capillary tube, which is shown here. Uh, and when they move down that tube, they still separate by a size, just like the regular electrophoresis we saw before. But when they exit the gel, a laser reads the color of each dideoxynucleotide as it exits the tube. So this is connected to a, a sort of light detector, which plots the, the amount of light, the colored light peaks, and then you can get the order of bases from that. So for example, uh, you just get these light peaks like this, and actually the machine just reads you out um, the, the bases according to which color of light uh, shows a peak at a certain point. So did you understand that um, at this point? Uh, you're going to have to go with me a little bit on this one because this in the class I'm probably doing oracy activity here. So I'd like you to see if you can do an oracy practice. Can you explain it back to me? All right, I'm here listening to you. Can you explain this back to me using the keywords on the right here in the blue box? So give it a go. Pause the video, obviously. See if you can explain it back to me. And if that feels too weird, explain it to uh, a pet, uh, a parent, a relative, or even a potted plant. Okay, I'll give you about two or three minutes to try and do that and then you can come back. Go. Okay, sounded pretty good to me. So those two first methods we looked at are what's called kind of first generation methods. And actually um, they took the cost of sequencing the genome down from about 100, um, 100 million US dollars to about 10 million US dollars. But then we started to get um, the next generation sequences entering the market in about 2007. And you can see that once they entered the market, these new techniques, the cost of sequencing absolutely plummeted. And they're really responsible for the fact that we can sequence DNA so fast today. So what are these next generation methods? Well, the main one that you need to know about is something called pyro sequencing. Okay. So uh, I'll explain a little bit about pyro sequencing first, and then you're going to watch this video on pyro sequencing. Again, I'll put that in the link, uh, sorry, the description of the video underneath. And if you have the PowerPoint, you can just hyperlink straight from there. But here are the basics. Uh, in pyro sequencing, it's a slightly different method. We use special bases. This time they're not dideoxy bases, but they're special bases that when they're added to the chain, it gives a flash of light. Now for this, a flash of light is generated, but it's not different color. There's just a flash of light generated whenever any base is added to the chain, A, C, T, or G. 
Well, in that case, how do you know which base is adding if you just keep getting flashes of light as it's added to a growing chain? Well, it's done quite cleverly. It's done using a system uh, containing a few different enzymes. We've got DNA polymerase, uh, ATP sulfurase, luciferase, and a pyrase. The luciferase is the enzyme that actually causes the flash of light. It's actually from a firefly. Um, but some of the other enzymes, what they do is they mean that the, um, the nucleotides that, uh, that add to the chain and generate the flash of light, they basically don't stick around for long. So um, you can add nucleotides and sort of pulses every few seconds like this. Add some A, add some C, add some G, add some T. That's sort of shown up here. You add them in pulses. And then if you add a pulse and there's no flash of light, you know there's no A. But if you add a pulse and there is a flash of light, then you know there is an A. And then you move on to the C. If you add a pulse, there's no light, there's no C. Then you move on to G, add a pulse uh, of G, and there is a flash. Okay, and you get a readout like this. So that's kind of the basics. Have a look at the video. Uh, it's about three or four minutes long, and then come back to me. That's called pyro sequencing. Off you go. Okay, hopefully that made a bit more sense. Take a second now, once you're back to back to me here, to look at this diagram uh, with fresh eyes, having just watched that video. Have a look at all the different parts of it. See if you can understand it. Um, and now let's look at a readout. So here is the readout that you would get from this sort of method. So this shows the level of light that is produced, the level, the level of kind of light flash, the number of photons really of light that's emitted every time you add a pulse of nucleotides. Now the, the nucleotides are added in a sequential fashion. It's always uh, goes in this case, T-A-C-G, T-A-C-G. So what this means is that the first um, added chemical T did not produce a flash of light, negligible. A did, so that means the first C, the first base in the chain is an A. C didn't produce anything. G, well, it actually produced triple the light that it should have done. So what's happening? Well, in that case, there are three bases added. So we know that the first base was an A, and then we've got G, 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 three Gs. Now we've got a T, an A, no C, there's a G, and then they have one, two Ts, and so on. So see if you can understand the rest of that sequence, see if you can write it down. What would the sequence be? Pause the video, come back to me in a few seconds. Okay, so here it is. So there's the sequence, okay? So T, triple C, A, T, C, double A, double G, A, T, double C, T, G, and then triple C to finish. So here is our plane ring, right? We've looked at three different methods, looked at original Sanger, we looked at the capillary gel sort of um, automated Sanger method, and then we've looked at the pyro sequencing, okay? So look at these three, up here, down here, and up here. For each one, I'd like to see if you can tell me what method of sequencing generated this readout, and then what's the sequence, okay? So write that down, three methods, three sequences. Take a few minutes, and we'll come back and see if you get the right answers. Okay, time for the answers. Here we go. First one, there's the sequence. Did you get it right? This is the uh, automated uh, dideoxy capillary gel sequencing method, so the updated Sanger. This one, that's the original Sanger, uh, original Sanger method with gel electrophoresis. And then this one here, that's the pyro sequencing, and there's the sequence there, okay? So that's the main point of the lesson, okay? Pretty much done, but I've got an extension for you, okay? It's pretty complicated, but the next, the newest sort of type of stuff is called Illumina sequencing. So I'll put this, if you want to go into those third generation techniques, uh, you can have a look at this, um, this video here. Uh, and Illumina sequencing, just in very brief outline, means that you can sample so many different clusters of DNA at the same time, okay? Imagine you've got a long strand of DNA you want to sample. You break it up into like, I don't know, a thousand different short segments. Each of those segments is thrown down onto a um, glass slide. And that's what each single dot represents. Each single dot represents a growing DNA uh, strand. So you wash um, different colorful 
bases across that and you take a photo and each dot, each color represents the base that has been added to that growing chain. And then you add another base and you take a photo. So each of those dots will change color. Uh, and then you wash another base, uh, some more bases over and you take a photo and you build that photo. So the same image here would change, the, each dot would change color every few seconds as you take photos, take photos, take photos. So what you're doing actually is you're sequencing every single different fragment of the DNA in parallel and then you use a computer at the end to kind of reconnect the sequence, kind of like an amazing DNA jigsaw. This basically means that you can sequence large amounts of DNA um, really, really fast. There's a little bit of error that sometimes creeps in, creeps in but it's, it's fast and it uses computational power to kind of reassemble the li library. This is actually how we sort of really did human genome projects. So if you want to look at that, watch the video about uh, third generation techniques uh, and Illumina sequencing. Um, so that is the end of that. I'll just go back to the sequence, uh, sorry, to the specification, just to kind of round it off. So here's the specification right there. Do you now understand the principles of DNA sequencing and the development of new DNA sequencing techniques? Uh, and have you sort of got an idea about the rapid advancements of the techniques used in sequencing, which have increased the speed of sequencing allowed for whole genome sequencing, e.g. high throughput sequencing? Hope that's helped, uh, and that's today's lesson. Thanks.